What's up guys, Dr. Alex Tatum here. Welcome to our final video in our four part series covering everything you could ever want to know about male fertility. Today, we're going to be talking about what we do when a man doesn't have sperm in their ejaculate and some of the specialized sperm retrieval procedures that we perform when we need to find sperm. If you wanna watch any of our earlier videos, check out the links in the description down below. And if you like this sort of content, make sure to click the subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Now let's kick things off with episode 12 of The Man Cave. So what does the phrase sperm retrieval procedure actually mean? Why do we ever need to go looking for sperm? Well, typically when there isn't any sperm in the ejaculate. When we're talking about this level of detail in male fertility, I think it's helpful to review some of the basics. Now, if you want the full deep dive on how sperm production works, I recommend checking out our first video in this series. That'll be in the corner of your screen and in the description down below. Basically, sperm are created in the testicle as part of a 74 day process known as spermatogenesis. After the sperm have been fully formed, they are then moved from the testicle itself to the epididymis. This is where sperm learn how to swim and become modal. They are then carried up through the vas deferens, also known as a sperm tube, before eventually reaching the prostate, where they will be expelled upon ejaculation. If a man ever doesn't have sperm in his ejaculate, he essentially has one of three types of problems. He either has one, a complete production problem, where he doesn't make any sperm, two, a partial production problem where he might make a tiny amount of sperm, but it's such a small amount it could only ever be found inside the testicle, or three, a plumbing problem where the sperm that's being made is somehow blocked from reaching the ejaculate. So how do we determine which of those three problems a man is dealing with? Well, a combination of the patient's history, the physical exam, and some blood tests, both hormone and genetic, can usually give us some guidance on which is the most likely scenario. Every man that's having his fertility checked, at least in our practice, will have a physical exam and a basic hormone panel. If a man has healthy sized testicles and normal hormone levels, he has a high likelihood of being blocked. This is called obstructive azospermia, and it implies that a man is making sperm, but it just can't get out into the ejaculate. Now, if a man has small testicles and abnormal hormone levels, specifically an elevation of one particular hormone known as FSH, then it's likely he has a partial or complete production problem. This is what's known as non-obstructive azospermia, or NOA. In addition to the basic hormone panel that we get in almost all men getting their fertility checked, we will often get special genetic tests in men who don't have sperm in their ejaculate. These tests frequently consist of a chromosome count known as a karyotype, a special test of the male chromosome known as a Y chromosome microdeletion, and a cystic fibrosis carrier screening test. Each of these tests looks for a specific genetic reason why a man could have obstructive or non-obstructive azospermia. For example, men who are found to be carriers of a single copy of a cystic fibrosis gene may never experience any lung symptoms or actually have clinical cystic fibrosis, but they will still have an extremely high likelihood of possessing a blockage that prevents the sperm being made inside their testicles from reaching the ejaculate. In contrast, a karyotype can determine if a man has chromosomal issues. One common condition that a karyotype can show is if a man happens to have an extra X chromosome. This is a condition known as Klinefelter syndrome, and the overwhelming majority of men with Klinefelters will either have a partial or complete sperm production problem. Now the Y chromosome microdeletion is a much more detailed kind of chromosomal test. Rather than counting all the chromosomes present in a cell or looking for large chromosomal problems, the Y chromosome microdeletion examines a very specific part of the male chromosome that's responsible for sperm production. If the test is positive, the Y chromosome microdeletion test can have a few different outcomes. Men can have either what's known as an AZF-A, AZF-B, or AZF-C deletion. Men with an AZF-A or B mutation have an irreversible and complete sperm production problem, while men with an isolated AZF-C deletion have the possibility of still making a small amount of sperm inside the testicle. So those are some of the key tests that we order when a man doesn't have sperm in his ejaculate. There are some other more straightforward reasons as to why a man may not have sperm in his ejaculate that actually don't require this testing though. For example, men that don't have sperm in their ejaculate because they're actively or have recently taken testosterone or other anabolic steroids rarely need this testing. 
Rather, they just need to stop taking their anabolic steroids and instead start medication to help reboot their natural sperm and testosterone production. And men who don't have sperm in their ejaculate because of a prior vasectomy don't need this special genetic testing either. They either need a vasectomy reversal or a sperm retrieval procedure. So what are those sperm retrieval procedures? When are they used and for which patients? Well, I think it's helpful to break these up based on anatomy. Let's start with the testicle. And remember, any sperm that's retrieved with a sperm retrieval procedure must be used with in vitro fertilization, also known as IVF, in order to achieve pregnancy. It cannot be used with intrauterine insemination or for conception at home. Now, the most basic sperm retrieval procedure that we perform at the level of the testicle is called a TASA, or a testicular sperm aspiration. This is where a small needle is placed into the testicle while attached to a syringe that's applying a small amount of suction. This quick five minute procedure allows us to retrieve a small amount of sperm directly from the testicle. This can be used as a therapeutic option to obtain sperm for IVF and is a common option for men with obstructive azospermia, which like we mentioned earlier, means men who have a blockage. Probably the most common scenario is a man who's previously had a vasectomy. What's nice about a TASA is that it's extremely easy to recover from. Men have very little soreness and are frequently back to work the same day. The drawback is that because we're only removing a very small amount of sperm, we don't always get enough to freeze for later. So when being done for IVF, a TASA usually has to be done the same day and there often won't be enough sperm left over to freeze for any later attempts. A TASA can be done in the office under local anesthesia or in a procedure room with a small amount of sedation if men really need it. But I always try to reassure patients, this is even less invasive than the average vasectomy and shouldn't be a source of anxiety. It's worth noting that a TASA can also be performed as a diagnostic option in the clinic for certain men. A great example is a man who's had a prior vasectomy, but he's also taken testosterone at some point. If we wanna confirm that he's even still making sperm, a TASA is a quick and easy way to confirm that in the office prior to any more formal procedures. Although it's worth noting that when done in the office for purely diagnostic purposes, that sperm can't be used for future IVF efforts. Now, what if we want the option to get sperm for use in IVF and have enough for future freezing? That brings us to the sperm retrieval procedure we probably perform most commonly in male fertility, which is the TESI. TESI stands for testicular sperm extraction, and in some cases is also called a testis biopsy. This is a procedure where instead of using a needle, we actually make a small opening in the skin so we can remove a section of sperm making testicular tissue. This offers us a lot more flexibility than a TASA at the expense of men being a little bit more sore for a few days, but it's still a small enough procedure that it can easily be done in the office or in a procedure room. The TESI is a procedure that has a broad range of applications. We will commonly perform a TESI for men with known obstructive azospermia who want to freeze sperm for use at a later date. This includes men with a history of prior vasectomy or men with a different kind of blockage like being a carrier for cystic fibrosis. A TESI is also a great option for men where it's not clear if they have obstructive or non-obstructive azospermia. In these cases, a TESI can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. It can reveal if a testicle is making a normal amount of sperm, and usually that sperm, if found, can be frozen for later use. A TESI can also be used in select men with non-obstructive azospermia. There's a lot of nuance to this decision though, and it's a little more controversial amongst experts, especially when compared to the next treatment option we'll discuss, the microtessi. So what is a microtessi? A microtessi, also known as a microdissection testicular sperm extraction, is a microscopic version of a tessie. Think of it this way, a tessie is like picking up to a book, turning to a random chapter, and then reading the chapter. In most cases, that will probably give you a good idea of what the book is about. A micro tessie, on the other hand, is like reading every single word cover to cover. It is an exhaustive look through both testicles using a high-powered surgical microscope. So when would someone need a micro tessie? Micro tessies are typically reserved for men with known non-obstructive azospermia. That means that we know that their testicles probably don't make very much sperm, if any at all. So if we're going to find some, we're going to have to look everywhere. Because the assumption is that we won't be able to find as much sperm, this commonly needs to be performed at the same time as a couple's planned IVF cycle. This means that the female partner is often going for her egg retrieval at the exact same time as the man is undergoing his microtessie. And because we can't guarantee that we'll find sperm, this can feel like a significant gamble for some couples. That's why some couples will elect to have donor sperm as backup in case we find out the man doesn't make sperm. So a microtessie, by necessity, often has more significant implications than just tessas or tessies. It is worth noting that it is possible to perform a microtessie prior to a planned IVF cycle. 
This is called a frozen microtessie and is nice in theory because it allows the couple to see if the man is making sperm before committing to an IVF cycle. Unfortunately, we commonly find that in these cases of very rare sperm production, as we only find a handful of sperm, that this sperm is frequently too fragile to survive the freeze-thaw cycle. That means, in our own personal professional opinion, a frozen microtessie has a higher risk of finding sperm that won't ultimately be viable when it comes time for IVF. Okay, so far we've covered tesas, tessies, and microtessies. Now let's move on anatomically from the testicle to the epididymis. The epididymis is the structure on the back of the testicle where sperm learn how to swim. Sometimes we'll try to get sperm directly from the epididymis in men who have a known blockage because some IVF experts prefer this more mature sperm. So when this is done with just a needle, it's called a PESA, or a percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration. Much like a TESA, this is typically only done on the day of IVF and there often isn't enough to freeze afterwards. If men want to have enough to freeze for later, we'll make an opening in the skin and commonly use the microscope. In these cases, the procedure is known as a MESA, or a microscopic epididymal sperm aspiration. So that's it for how we evaluate men with no sperm in their ejaculate and how we perform sperm retrieval procedures. And that also brings us to a close on our four part series covering almost everything you could ever want to know about the topic of male fertility. If you haven't checked out our other videos, I would highly recommend that you do so, and they'll be included in the description down below. If you yourself or a man you know is questioning their fertility, please reach out to us and make your appointment today. Call us at 877-362-2778 or visit our website at www.indymenshealth.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Alex Tatum signing off. Music